Okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you to everyone for joining this Twitter space. And good morning from uh, New York. You may be able to hear the sound of Manhattan traffic in the background um, as, as we speak. Uh, I am Richard Gowan. I am Crisis Group's UN Director. And I'm talking today with my close colleague, um, Ashish Pradhan, who is Crisis Group's uh, senior analyst for the UN. And of course, we're speaking today because it is what for people like us is the most wonderful time of the year. Uh, it is uh, the UN General Assembly uh, opening. And next week is the high level session of the UNGA. Uh, a very large number of presidents and prime ministers are coming to New York um, for what will be the first normal General Assembly since 2019. In 2020, uh, the General Assembly was all online and was about as much fun as online events uh, usually were during the pandemic. Last year, there was a in-person meeting of the General Assembly uh, featuring President Biden uh, for the first time, but it was scaled down. Uh, this year, by contrast, there are still some COVID restrictions on meetings at the UN, but uh, we are essentially back to normal. And uh, it will be a very big event indeed. But of course, we're not really back to normal because uh, leaders uh, coming to New York, many of them, by the way, coming straight from Queen Elizabeth's funeral, will be focused on some very serious challenges to international security and to the multilateral system. Above all, this year, leaders of the General Assembly will be talking about Russia's war on Ukraine. And looking beyond the war itself, they will be talking about its ramifications for the global economy, uh, for global food prices and um, global energy prices. I think that the war is going to overshadow uh, this year's General Assembly and uh, the sense of a homecoming we might have hoped for after COVID uh, sadly won't, uh, won't be quite as happy as um, one might have predicted. Um, what we're going to do now is talk a little bit about what to expect at the General Assembly and then we're going to talk about a new publication from Crisis Group, uh, which uh, went online yesterday. Um, that is our annual publication, uh, 10 Challenges for the UN in the Year Ahead. And Ashish and I uh, coordinated that publication and we'll tell you a little bit about what's in, in there. It covers challenges ranging from uh, the conflict in Mali um, to uh, climate change. But before we get on to that, uh, Let's talk a little bit of food in New York um, with the General Assembly coming up. Um, Ashish, uh, you have been working the phones uh, pretty constantly for the last uh, few weeks, uh, arranging meetings, talking to diplomats about the, uh, the upcoming General Assembly session. Uh, what do you think that the mood around the UN is uh, right now? Hey, Richard. Thanks for that. And thanks for everyone for joining. Um, I think, Richard, you, you hit the nail on the head, you know, in terms of this being the first full-fledged General Assembly uh, in the last uh, three years. And, uh, you know, what I've been picking up over the, over the last few days and weeks, uh, and especially in, in this last week where the, the high-level week um, has really sort of been a, a, you know, the, the shadow over everyone's heads in and around Turtle Bay, is both a sense of excitement and a little bit of dread. Uh, one diplomat that I was speaking to just yesterday was describing, for instance, how uh, their government was sending a delegation of over 300 officials to New York. So you can just imagine the kind of logistical challenges, the kind of uh, uh, you know pressing needs that that uh, puts on diplomats who all of a sudden have to drop their day jobs in terms of uh, you know following substantive issues to then have to corral uh, you know various schedules and agendas for their principals and their ministers. But substantively speaking, of course, and as we uh, outlined in our um, briefing that we published yesterday, you know the. The, the General Assembly, you know, comes at a time of uh, a lot of questions that the UN and the multilateral system is facing, which I'm sure we can get into. Uh, the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, that kicked off in February. You know, the the, the main sort of uh, shadow that hangs over proceedings uh, next week. Uh, I think, you know, this being the first General Assembly since the war began, you know, will provide a platform for. Um, 
from officials and governments from you know the various sides of of that conflict to you know, press their positions, you know, make uh, you know a lot of uh, rhetorical uh, and and symbolic speeches and gestures. I think uh, so. Even if, as usual, at the General Assembly, we may not see uh, you know uh, new policies necessarily being created or announced. There's a lot of uh, symbolic and rhetorical um, uh, issues to look out for in, in in the week ahead. And of course. Um... One big question is whether Ukraine's president um, and Zelensky will address the the General Assembly, and there's been a bit of drama about that. Um, we'll we'll describe what's going on in a second, but before uh, before we do, um, I should say something important that I, I should have said at the outset, which is uh, uh, we want to hear your questions. Um, and so if you're listening to this and you have questions really about any aspect of the General Assembly week or the work of the UN more generally, um, please send them by DM. Please send them by direct message to the Crisis Group main Twitter account. That's at Crisis Group. And um, we have some uh, uh, little gnomes um, in the background who will forward the questions to me um, and I will uh, I will read them out online. So all questions, please uh, DM them to uh, the crisis group main account. Um, but Ashish, uh, just before I broke off, I said, you know, one of the big questions is, will we be hearing from uh, you know, the man of 2022, um, President Zelensky uh, at the General Assembly? What are we hearing on that? So on that one, Richard, it uh, it appears set that today there will be a vote at the General Assembly on whether to allow uh, for President Zelensky to offer a speech uh, remotely and virtually. Uh, it may sound like a uh, an obvious point, but the UN is uh, is a place for a lot of protocol uh, and where uh, you know officials and diplomats are not necessarily the easiest to work with in terms of switching around the way things work. And the way things usually work at high level week is that statements and speeches are made in person. Uh, if not by the head of state, then whichever official is leading the delegation for a particular member state, which could be the foreign minister, which could be their ambassador. In this case, even if President Zelensky is not able to be here in person, Ukraine has requested uh, for an exceptional um, uh, allowance in this case so that he can provide either, I think it may be a recorded uh, speech uh, on, on video. And I think, you know, uh, in terms of how that could uh, play out, you know, that's something else that we can discuss as well. You know, what sort of reaction that will get, you know, I think Richard, you were also, uh, you know, speaking earlier this week about, uh, you know, how there will obviously be a groundswell of support uh, and, and a show of support to Zelensky, uh, you know, during that speech, especially from Ukraine's main allies among the European members, among the US, I'm sure. Uh, but there also might might be some more mixed reactions from officials from other parts of the globe, and, and that'll be you know a, a curious thing to track as well as we as we head into head into next week. Uh, yes, I mean it. It seems that the general assembly members will have to vote. I think it may actually end up being tomorrow on whether Zelensky should be allowed to give a video speech. And you know, although it is a procedural matter, this actually will be a a test of. Uh, UN member states' attitudes towards Ukraine. Um, back in March, in the early weeks of the war, uh, there was a, a real surge of support for uh, Ukraine uh, at the UN, and uh, 141 members of the General Assembly supported a resolution condemning Russia's aggression. But as we at Crisis Group started to warn in late March and early April, that level of support for the Ukrainians has proved uh, difficult to sustain. And even in the spring, diplomats were starting to talk about a sense of Ukraine fatigue uh, at the UN, because while many uh, non-Western diplomats do sympathise uh, with the Ukrainian position, uh, that they also want to focus on issues other than the war, such as the global food crisis um, and the global economic downturn. Uh, in recent months, Ukraine and its allies in the UN system haven't been tabling further General Assembly resolutions over the war because they are concerned that they simply wouldn't be able to muster the same level of support uh, that we saw back in March. And so actually this vote on whether Zelensky should be allowed to give a video speech, which does sound, let's be honest, pretty trivial, becomes a bit of a test um, of uh, people's attitudes towards Ukraine because, you know, the the simple question of how big a majority there will be in support of him speaking will be seen as a barometer of uh, other countries' attitudes towards the war. So um, this 
this general assembly session even before it's begun uh is turning into a an opportunity to test uh international perceptions of um the war between uh, russia and ukraine um ashish we have been talking a lot to uh, dip- diplomats from both western and non-western countries over the last uh, six seven months about the war um i mean how would you uh, say that our colleagues from Africa, Asia and Latin America view the, the conflict at this time. Is, is this idea of Ukraine fatigue a reality? I think so, Richard. And I think, you know, it's obviously nuanced. And I think there is there is an appreciation for the stakes at play, you know, between Russia and Ukraine, you know, certainly between Russia and Europe, Russia and the West, but also a, 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 a really deep sense, uh, you know, that there is limited bandwidth. And, you know, this is something that we've been observing and tracking for uh, a, a long time, you know, Richard and, and, and my work at, at, at the UN is really mostly focused on the Security Council. And over the years, you know, we have seen the Council be, uh, you know, really limited in its ability to respond to various crises around the world as it is. Uh, and when the invasion started in late February, you know, we we saw the Council kick into action as much as it could, uh, even if Russia was really restricting what the Council could meaningfully do uh, by the use of its veto power. Uh, But it also meant that there were a lot of meetings uh, that were uh, held on Ukraine, understandably so, but it meant that ambassadors, officials in and around uh, the Security Council really had to take their time away from other regions and devote that to Ukraine. And again, you know, because of just the, the, the strains that that's placed on the system, you know, we started to hear this quite early on, you know, maybe even I think late March and in April where, you know, uh, ambassadors, you know, from uh, non-Western countries on the council, especially those from African members on the council, you know, started to say quite explicitly that they thought uh, the conflicts from their region were getting short shrift and were getting uh, neglected in, in relation to all the various discussions of Ukraine. And so, uh, you know, I think between that and what we also have seen at the General Assembly, where, as you mentioned, Richard, there's been maybe a, a decreasing uh, a level of, of focus and a decreasing level of space for Ukraine-related initiatives and and uh, uh, you know, resolutions and, and votes, uh, it all ind- indicates that, uh, you know, uh, the member states from, from other parts of the globe really want to refocus at least some amount of that attention back to them. And, you know, not certainly uh, also not to ignore the uh, impacts that the Ukraine war has had on these regions, on these countries, because of the food, uh, fuel and commodity shocks that it's contributed to, which I'm sure we can also also talk about. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, if we're looking at the agenda for for next week, it is clear that uh, the US, um, uh, the Europeans and other Western powers are trying to show that they're conscious of uh, the concerns um, of non-Western countries at the General Assembly. And so while there will be uh, clearly a focus on Ukraine and there's going to be a special foreign minister level meeting of the Security Council on Ukraine uh, convened by France. Uh, there's also going to be a lot of talk about uh, other global concerns and above all the uh, huge rise in food prices that we've seen this year that is at least in part attributable to um, the Ukrainian war. Uh, the US, European Union and the African Union were all planning to hold summits on the global food crisis. Uh, Luckily, uh, diplomats saw sense and realized that having three summits on the same issue uh, would be um, a bit too much. And so they've been merged and there's going to be a single summit hosted by uh, the US, the EU and the AU on the global situation. In addition to that, there are going to be some meetings that we'll be watching closely on uh, food, uh, food challenges and the threat of famine. Uh, especially in the Horn of Africa. Um, Italy, I think, is hosting um, a meeting specifically on the Horn of Africa. And there are very good substantive reasons that the General Assembly will be talking about uh, international food prices. Um, But it is pretty obvious that um, Western countries are really emphasising this theme because they they understand that they need to do so uh, to maintain the support of non-Western countries for Ukraine. Um, There is, to some extent, a global quid pro quo um, about relating to food and um, the Ukrainian situation. So, yeah, overall, the the two dominant themes next week will be uh, Ukraine and and food prices. Uh, We're not seeing so much discussion of uh, energy issues, 
um, which is perhaps surprising because uh, the rise in global energy prices is also a major concern. Um, now, in the middle of all this, Ashish, one uh, one statesman who will naturally be in the spotlight is the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. And Guterres has been quite prominent at different stages of uh, Russia's war on Ukraine, especially in addressing um, uh, the question of Ukrainian grain exports. How, how would you say that the Secretary General has done uh, in 2022? I think that she has, uh, you know, emerged from this uh, this ongoing war as, you know, I think, one of the few international officials who have maybe improved their uh, credibility and standing. Obviously, this is all relative, but you know, before the the invasion and the war began, I think there was a a bit of a sense, you know, in and around the UN that maybe the SG was a little bit slow getting out of the gates and in recognizing the, the threat that Russia was posing at the time. But, you know, he eventually switched on to, uh, you know, a, a mode where I think he drew on his his work and experience in, in the past, you know, working on humanitarian issues as the head of uh, the UN's refugee agency, you know, where he, you know, I think recognized that the UN may have had limited space to influence the uh, core issues at play between Russia and Ukraine and Russia and the West. But he re- he's at the same time also saw that there was an opportunity for the UN to step in and help save lives and at least mitigate the fallout and the, the, let's say the symptoms of the war. And you know we've seen that play out with the uh, role that the UN played in evacuating civilians from uh, Azovstal's uh, uh, steelworks uh, plant. We saw the, uh, the the grain deal that you mentioned, Richard, where the, the, the UN played a helpful role in coordinating and facilitating that uh, agreement alongside uh, Turkey. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's also, you know, been offering its, uh, its services and its assistance to try to manage any potential fallout over the uh, nuclear power plant, you know, which has been a cause of major concern in recent weeks. And in all of these, I think, you know, the, the Secretary General has uh, displayed, obviously, a, a sense of uh, initiative uh, in a sense of, you know, also offering whatever the UN can offer, you know, again, to save lives and, and manage the, the, the human consequences of the fighting, uh, even if he recognizes that uh, in terms of the big picture uh, and the, the actual direction of travel in the war, the U- UN is a little bit on the outside looking in. So all things considered, you know, especially given that the war has continued to, to grind on, uh, you know, he's, I think he's managed to, to, to play his cards as well as he, he could so far. I think that's right. Uh, you know, it's worth saying that Russia has made it, I think, pretty clear that while it is happy to work with the UN on fixing certain issues related to the war, such as um, the grain deal, it doesn't view the Secretary General as a potential mediator or someone who can... Uh, you know, find the political solution to this conflict. Guterres is very much the fixer in chief, um, finding solutions to specific problems associated with the conflict, uh, rather than dealing with the the core issue itself. But as as Ashish rightly says, you know, if you go back to the very start of the year, it wasn't either that um, the Secretary General would be able to play that role. And I mean, he has he has stepped into the breach, and. I would say he is one of the very few figures in, in international diplomacy whose uh, reputation has improved over the last six or seven months um, uh, because of the way he's engaged um, in the war. Um, Ashish, let's, uh, let's turn back to some of the other crises and conflicts that are hovering around uh, the UN as the General Assembly begins. Uh, as you said a little earlier in the um, call, a lot of diplomats, uh, especially diplomats from outside Europe, are worried that w- with a very strong focus on Ukraine, the Security Council and other UN bodies are not focusing hard enough on problems elsewhere. And you know that's something that we have also flagged in our annual publication on challenges for the UN, because if you look across the global landscape, uh, you can see quite a lot of trouble spots where the UN is engaged. Uh, where situations are bad or getting worse. Um, When we were preparing this publication, we had uh, sort of an internal debate about uh, which trouble spots to prioritise and what we should say the biggest challenges for the UN uh, are in the year ahead. Uh, Obviously, Ukraine was one, but we decided that actually we should emphasise another, uh, which is the situation in Mali. Um, where the UN has a peacekeeping force, which is really struggling 
right now to keep functioning in the face of jihadi attacks um, and uh, very bad relations with the government of Mali. Um, Ashish, you, you've been looking at this closely along with uh, Crisis Group's West Africa team. And maybe you could tell us why why we decided that we should give Mali such a, a prominent place in our list of challenges for the UN. Um, while Ashish is doing that, uh, please do send in questions. I, I can see uh, a lot of friends, a lot of former students um, uh, listening in, and it would be great to have your, your questions. But Ashish, tell us, tell us why we have the focus. Sure, Richard. I think, uh, you know, Mali, in a lot of ways, really, you know, encapsulates a number of the issues, you know, at play that are, uh, you know, uh, uh, challenging the the way that the UN operates, uh, both on the ground, uh, you know, uh, in terms of its peacekeeping operations, but also the political impediments to its work. Uh, and I think, you know, overarching, uh, in an overarching sense, uh, you know, the, the one of the main features of the uh, crisis in Mali over the last, let's say, year and a half, two years has been the geopolitical uh, uh, factors at play, especially with Russia's um, entry into the fray with um, the uh, reported uh, um, deployment of Russian uh, military trainers uh, and, and uh, under um, Wagner Group, which has uh, been part of a overall shift from the Malian authorities away from its Western partners, including the French, uh, towards a relationship that is uh, much more seemingly much more reliant on Russia. And that has had consequences uh, at the Security Council in terms of uh, the, the, the discussions on Mali becoming much more tense than they previously used to be. The Mali file uh, at the Security Council was one where there was a general amount of consensus in the past, and that is no longer the case. But now, uh, not only has that meant that the Malian government and its relationship with you know, other governments, uh, like those in Paris or Washington, are more difficult, it's also meant that uh, the relationship between Bamako and the UN is uh, on a uh, much trickier footing. And that's meant that uh, the Malian authorities have made life very difficult for the UN mission in the country, MINUSMA, to move around, to access different parts of the country, to be able to carry out uh, investigations into human rights abuses uh, and uh, um, uh, attacks on civilians. And that's been particularly uh, important because uh, operations carried out by the Malian security forces in conjunction with uh, Russian uh, military personnel uh, under Wagner Group uh, have taken quite a heavy uh, toll on civilians already. You know, there have been reports and uh, in incidents of hundreds of civilians being killed in certain attacks uh, in, in parts of central and in northern Mali. And you know, the, the UN mission in the country, which has a pretty strong mandate to be uh, monitoring, observing, and reporting on these sorts of incidents, is no longer being really able to do so because they've been deprived of the ability to go into these sorts of areas and really assess what's happened. And that's led to a lot of questions about uh, the the rationale for the UN remaining in a country like this, where it seems like it's not really welcome, it seems like uh, it's you know some of its primary tasks are, are tasks that can no longer carry out. At the same time, there is still a an overarching sense of. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, a sort of a countervailing sense of maybe the UN should still remain to try to do what it can. There are good things that the UN does as well in terms of the work that it does in terms of bottom up, uh, you know, uh, political work that its staff does on the ground, some support that it also is able to provide to the Malian authorities. But all of this to say that, you know, it's a, it's a unique uh, and sadly sort of a, a, a quite a, a, a case that really captures a lot of the, the tensions where geopolitical uh, elements are involved. But more importantly, what we wanted to focus on in our report was that there are a lot of problems inherent to Mali, where we think that the UN still has a role to play, but there is a lot of uh, maybe hard conversations that the UN has to have with the authorities in Bamako about its ability to carry on that kind of important work. And I mean, although Mali is a unique case, it's not actually the only situation where a UN peacekeeping force is you know, facing a, a very serious political and security challenge. Um, there's also the Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC, um, another case that we uh, listed as one of the main current challenges for the UN. Um, UN peacekeepers have been in uh, the Congo uh, for over 20 years. Um, uh, they've faced many crises in that time. But this year, there seems to be a particularly acute uh, challenge to the peacekeeping force in the east of the country. Um, Ashish, tell us a bit more about what's happening there. And, and again, why we flag that as one of the major challenges for the, the UN in the year ahead. Uh, 
Well, in the in the DRC region, I think the the um, overlap of interests and involvement of regional actors and also of the UN, you know, it, it is one that's really worth um, worth considering. And I think it's it's one where the uh, reported uh, in, involvement of uh, Rwanda and uh, its role in uh, the resurgence of the uh, notorious uh, armed group, the M23, you know, has been uh, uh, a cause for a serious concern because it's reminded people of the, the DRC's really troubled past with proxy wars and conflicts. And, you know, it still uh, you know, remains a, a country where the UN has a really big peacekeeping operation. Again, parts of the, the mission do have uh, the mandate to, to take on offensive operations and go against armed groups. But at the same time, uh, it's, a, it's a mission that for the last couple of years has been uh, attempting to wind down its presence and footprint in certain parts of the country and really focus on some of the most sensitive areas. But now the UN finds itself in an environment where it's a, what we'll call a security traffic jam, where we've got troops from neighboring Uganda deployed in Eastern Congo that are going after a rebel group called the ADF, which is notoriously hostile to the authorities in Kampala. Uh, there are now Burundian uh, troops who are deployed under a new uh, East African regional force that's also meant to go in and tackle armed groups. Meanwhile, you also have MONUSCO on the ground, plus the uh, DRC authorities. So it's quite a convoluted uh, and quite a packed security environment where you know, one can imagine the difficulties in terms of coordination, in terms of deconfliction, uh, in terms of intelligence sharing, and generally just making sure that every, you know, all of these various actors, international actors, are all on the same page and not making the crisis worse. And again, you know, this is a situation where the UN is very much on the outside looking in, in terms of the actual big picture political questions. Uh, it's certainly not really been in the room in terms of decisions around uh, the deployment of this East African regional force. And this is a force where, as we say in our report, there are more questions than answers at the moment, uh, you know, especially in regards to whether uh, the troops that are meant to be deployed under this force from the regional countries will take uh, the measure that will be necessary to ensure that you know, human rights um, abuses are not committed, that you know, humanitarian law and international law is upheld in the way in which uh, the, the forces will go about their operations. And there are serious questions around, the, around whether the military uh, approach that this force represents will necessarily be married with a uh, political strategy of any sort. And so, you know, for all of these reasons, you know, the, the, and, and also the fact that the, the UN mission itself, as you were saying, Richard, you know, has really come uh, under the under the, the gun, you know, almost literally and and and, and uh, figuratively, uh, in terms of a lot of popular protests against the UN mission because there is a lot of discontent at a UN mission that people on the ground see as having a lot of capacities, a lot of footprint, a lot of peacekeepers, but those peacekeepers not being able to carry out their work and not really being able to do much about the increasing violence that are. That that's being perpetrated by armed groups. And all of this has, has meant that the UN finds itself in a, in a quite a, a tricky spot, especially with uh, a major presidential election uh, taking place a little over a year from now or supposed to take place a little over a year from now. So the UN is also a potential convenient scapegoat for some where its valid shortcomings have been the subject of a lot of uh, social media disinformation campaigns, which again has put uh, the UN mission there, MONUSCO, uh, under a lot of pressure. So this is one as well, which I think we'll continue to see the council and the UN uh, try to grapple with in the in the year ahead. Um, thanks, Ashish. I mean, I, I would say that. I mean, I, I have I have worked on UN issues and specifically used to do a lot of work on peacekeeping uh, for about twenty years. And I think that if you had had the sort of convergence of crises that we're now seeing for the Blue Helmets in Mali and in the Congo, you know, ten years ago it would have been a focus for a huge amount of debate and um, a concern in New York. I think there would have been a lot of talk about a more general crisis of, of peacekeeping emerging, um, but we just really have not heard that sort of debate this year because it wouldn't be fair to say that these situations are afterthoughts for the UN, but they are being overshadowed by, by the situation in Ukraine. And I think that if these crises continue, and especially if the situation in Mali becomes so difficult that uh, the peacekeeping force eventually has to withdraw, which is a possibility, um, you know, that, that will set off a debate about the future of, of Blue Helmet operations, um, which, uh, you know, could be uh, a, pretty, a pretty serious challenge for the UN.
Um, in addition to focusing on situations where the UN has peacekeepers, um, our, our annual publication looks at a lot of places um, where the UN is primarily present in a humanitarian role. And those include uh, northwest Syria, where the UN uh, supplies aid to uh, the inhabitants of the Idlib enclave, uh, the enclave that is still controlled by, by rebels. It also includes Afghanistan, uh, where the UN has played a, uh, a very big role in terms of um, humanitarian insist- assistance uh, since the fall of Kabul last year. And finally, it actually in- includes Ukraine itself, because although it hasn't got very much attention, uh, the UN does have a significant uh, humanitarian presence in Ukraine. It has over a thousand staff working um, on relief efforts in the country. And by the UN's own estimates, it's got some form of assistance to roughly nine million Ukrainians so far this, this year. And what draws these very different cases together is that, um, you know, in each case, the UN is not really well situated, sadly, uh, to find a political solution uh, to the conflicts involved. Uh, it's These are not situations where the UN can put blue helmets on the ground, but the UN is still present um, through the work of its humanitarian uh, agencies. Um, now, there is some concern, I think, uh, in New York that the UN is shifting from being an organisation that addresses the political origins of conflict to being primarily what some would say is just a big humanitarian NGO, um, just a, a, a sort of a, a relief agency with, um, without much of a political role in many situations. Uh, do you think that's a fair assessment, Ashish? Or um, you know, should we actually be celebrating the fact that the UN does continue to have such a big humanitarian footprint in very tough environments like Afghanistan? Well, I think, uh, you know, it's uh, obviously in all those uh, those three cases that you mentioned, Richard, quite complex and you know, ones where, you know, just carving out uh, and retaining a humanitarian role and presence in itself has, has been a bit of a challenge. And, you know, especially when you look at Afghanistan and the, the, the situation that the country was in a year ago and the, the major uncertainties that the Taliban's takeover posed for the wider international system and international actors, uh, and to the UN specifically, you know, where the UN was the last and remaining, it's no longer the case now, but was for a period the only international presence on the ground and eyes and ears on the ground, and the one that was capable of uh, you know, continuing to supply really much needed assistance. It also came with a lot of, let's say, political landmines where the, the work that the UN does uh, with its uh, its mission on the ground, UNAMA, in providing this sort of assistance, but also the needing uh, the need that it has to engage with Taliban officials that now run the uh, the Afghanistan government, you know, the, the the authorities that are that are running the country at the moment, uh, you know, means that, that the UN is uh, in, in a place where uh, it, it can be seen as. Uh, you know, having to really walk a, a fine line between continuing uh, relationships and a channel uh, with some very, very unsavory to be polite uh, actors, uh, while not doing anything that could be seen as conferring any amount of legitimacy or recognition uh, to uh, the Taliban, which is quite uh, um, hungry for that kind of international sort of stamp of approval. Uh, and we've seen this, uh, thankfully, not play out that much in and around New York itself, where there have been conversations around um, the, the the status of the official representatives uh, for for the uh, Afghanistanis. Um, but you know, on the ground, you know, I think there's uh, a, a desire by uh, Taliban um, officials and individuals to really try to get you know, any amount of. Uh, international sort of legitimacy to really burnish their credentials, because that's also how they, I think, uh, foresee themselves being able to get uh, an amount of sort of normalization uh, with the, with the outside system, and and that's a message that we hear from certain actors as well. You know, certainly at the Security Council, the likes of China and Russia have been pushing for you know the the, the international system to, and I'm paraphrasing here, just sort of get on with things and learn to live with the fact that the Taliban are in power and need to be engaged with. But obviously, on the other side. A lot of hesitation from other actors, not just Western, but you know, a lot of Western members who you know, don't want to necessarily cross that Rubicon, you know, because there is a clear sense that the Taliban have not earned that kind of you know, legitimacy or credibility. And there, I think there had been a lot of focus on the situation of women and girls in particular, and understandably so, as you know, one of the key barometers for 
uh, you know, how to assess the Taliban and whether they would be, uh, you know, whether they would be taking a different approach in governing uh, versus when they were obviously not in power. And, you know, as we saw earlier this year with the decrees, uh, you know, against uh, girls' education, against um, the, 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 the face coverings that the women had to wear uh, in the country, you know, it's uh, indicated that it, it has been unfortunately more of the same, which is really, uh, you know, even for uh, a lot of Western governments who were, you know, hoping to, you know, in, in some ways find uh, and continue a channel through which you know, this sort of critical assistance and aid could continue flowing in the country. Now, I think are, are seeing that, uh, you know, there are, again, a lot of questions about the, 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 the validity of working with the sort of government, but that continues to spot like the UN, which again is on the ground, is doing this kind of work anyway. It seems like it'll have to weather the storm in terms of, um, you know, the the sort of potential reputational uh, uh, balancing act that I mentioned earlier, where it has to continue doing its, its operational work, maybe take, you know, some political hits with some governments that really, uh, you know, are, are very, very cautious in terms of engagements with the Taliban. But you know, all that to say that I think, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's the kind of complex environment where it's really important work that the UN does in terms of the humanitarian space. But politically, you know, it, it definitely does have a bearing. And you know, I'm sure it uh, creates a lot of uh, uh, difficulties and, and I think sleepless nights for UN officials that have to you know, figure out a way that they do both, uh, continue supplying that assistance, but not do anything that is seen as overly uh, uh, minimizing the, the Taliban in any way. Thanks, and it's a great, I mean, it, it is a great example, although for very tragic reasons, of UN still has um, some value because, you know, although the organization does face you know huge problems in afghanistan um it's hard to think who else could be playing this role of you know trying to keep relations going with the taliban um after the fall of kabul but um i've always wanted to say this i i have some breaking news um i have some breaking news about uh next week's uh general assembly uh, session um which is uh, that for the first time at least in my memory uh we've just heard that the us president won't be speaking on the first morning of the high-level session. Um, uh, Joe Biden would normally have been speaking on the morning of the 20th of September. Uh, normally, the US president um, is the second speaker, by tradition, after the president of Brazil um, at the General Assembly. And what the US president says you know, sets the tone and, and sets the agenda for the rest of the week. But um, Joe Biden is not going to be able to speak on Tuesday morning because he will be on his way back from London, where he is attending the funeral of Queen Elizabeth. And uh, it's just been confirmed, I've just heard from a diplomatic contact, that Biden is moving his speech. Um, he will be speaking uh, on Wednesday morning at 10.30, um, uh, which presumably gives him a bit of time to rest and recover after his, his visit to the United Kingdom. Um, he is swapping his slot with Senegal. Um, Macky Sall, the president of Senegal, will uh, fill in for the US on, on Tuesday morning. So that shakes up, um, uh, you know, that shakes up a lot of diplomats plans, at least for, for next week. Um, it also raises the question of what Joe Biden is going to say when he eventually uh, does address fellow leaders. Um, obviously, you know, we, we don't have access to um, the president's speech. Um, I think typically, U.S. officials keep on working on that speech right up until the moment uh, when it is is given. But um, Ashish, what, what do you think we'll hear from Joe Biden when he gives his delayed address to the General Assembly? Well, firstly, Richard, just to say that, um, uh, you know, I'll try to play down the amount of panic in the crisis group office, uh, you know, emanating from this, uh, you know, I think expected schedule change. And as, as one can. We're, we're panicking. We're panicking right now. I'm in a panic. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, as, as you can imagine, uh, you know, the amount of attention that the, any U.S. president's speech at the General Assembly generates uh, can have a cascading effect on anything else happening at the same time. So let's see uh, what's, uh, what, you know, what things had been uh, in the schedule for Wednesday morning and, and what will remain that way. But in terms of the, the substance of what we expect from, from, from Joe Biden, at the, at the GA, and obviously, I think you know, Ukraine will be uh, front and center. Center, and I, I think you know we may uh, hear and see the kind of uh, messages that the U.S. has been, uh, you know, trying to relay even before the invasion began, but especially since, you know, which is that you know this is obviously not just about Ukraine. That you know, since he'll be here speaking at the UN at the General Assembly Hall, I think he'll probably also try to emphasize that this was indeed an attack on. Um, 
the UN Charter on international law, the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity that so many uh, countries and governments uh, in and around the, the UN really hold dear. So I think that will be one message. Obviously, uh, you know, um, naming and shaming Russia, uh, I, I imagine, will be a, a major thrust as well. And I also, in something you were saying earlier this week, Richard, you know, will be interesting to see is how he and whether he uh, addresses China. Um, I think, as uh, we saw last year. You know, President Biden uh, had a lot of messages that were pointed at the Chinese without directly referencing uh, Beijing, without referencing the, the, the China directly at all, uh, but instead, you know, making sort of inferred suggestions that the, the messages about democracy, uh, you know, were, were really aimed at undermining the kind of global standing of Beijing. We may see a, a similar sort of uh, indirect approach, you know, because I imagine the, the focus in terms of the more sort of punchy parts of the speech will be on Russia and the need to continue uh, putting uh, a, a great amount of international pressure on Russia. I also expect, as you were saying, Richard, um, you know, a, a refocusing and an argument that the kind of difficulties that uh, many of the governments uh, who will be in attendance on Wednesday are facing in terms of the higher uh, prices for food, fuel, commodities uh, are not uh, a consequence of Western sanctions on Russia, that in fact it's Russia who is to blame for uh, for these uh, uh, price increases that are, you know a lot of a lot of governments are, are struggling with. So I imagine those sort of three or four buckets will be what uh, that speech will focus on. I think that's right. And I, I should say, by the way, that um, I see the uh, one of the listen listeners to this conversation is Mark Leon Goldberg. Um, uh, Mark is himself probably the top podcaster and, um, about all things UN. And uh, he and I were meant to be doing a Twitter space uh, on Tuesday after Biden spoke. But I guess we'll now be doing that, Mark, on, on Wednesday. But um, do do watch out for that if you enjoy uh, listening to this sort of thing. Um, I actually want to link to a question that uh, we have got from uh, an old friend, uh, Piotr Curzon, um, who used to work with us in Crisis Group's New York office. Uh, and this relates to the US. Um, Piotr notes that uh, last week, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, the US ambassador to the UN, gave a speech in which uh, she said that the US reflecting on what it has seen uh, over Ukraine, thinks that it is time uh, for a push to reform the Security Council. And Linda Thomas-Greenfield did not make it very clear what sort of reforms she was referring to, but this has definitely created a bit of excitement uh, around um, the UN, um, because generally speaking, the US has not been massively interested in the past in proposals to sort of fundamentally change the way the Security Council works, um, who's sitting in the Security Council. Um, but the Biden administration does appear to be interested in, in exploring those questions in the wake of the war on Ukraine. Um, so I think the big question and the question that Piotr asks is, does this mean that uh, we're likely to... Uh, we're likely to see sort of big reforms to the UN system in the, the near future. Um, Ashish, what's your gut instinct on that? Thanks, Richard. I mean, obviously, an important question and, and one where, you know, you, one does get the sense that if not now, then when, you know, do you start to really consider at least you know, options and ideas about, uh, you know, some much needed reform? And I think, you know, the, the longstanding calls for, you know, for instance, um, having a security council that better represents the current, uh, you know, uh, international order versus one from uh, over seven decade, decades ago, and certainly are, are very valid. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, in terms of uh, practice, Practicalities, you know, as you mentioned, uh, you know, despite uh, you know rhetorical support for reform-related efforts, as we saw with Ambassador Thomas Greenfield last week, and as we've seen from some other officials and members, you know, like uh, France, um, in terms of actually uh, you know carving out uh, a, a space or even a, you know a pathway for these kinds of reforms, that's where I think. Um, the, the, the sort of the, the sort of uh, uh, um, direction of travel is less clear. Uh, I think partially because it reflects the the interests at play, and obviously, as much as in the likes of the U.S. Uh, may try to pin this on, uh, you know, the likes of Russia and China for 
not being open to Security Council reform. Um, there's also a, you know, a clear vested interest for Western members, the, the P3, the US, UK, and France, to retain um, the, the, the P5 and the current order because it, for them, preserves their own sort of special status. And, you know, it, it, it confers on them an extra layer of uh, authority, an extra layer of decision making. And, you know, and, and this uh, percolates not just in terms of the veto power, which everyone knows and has been well documented, but also procedurally, you know, in, in, in ways where, you know, a lot of the countries on the Security Council agenda, the way in which those countries are dealt with are primarily uh, led by, uh, you know, members of the P5, especially the P3, the Western members of the Permanent Five that I mentioned. And so, you know, it does seem like a, a system that isn't necessarily the most balanced and does require some amount of rethinking. And I think, you know, it'd be great to see at least some ideas that come and those given a, a fair hearing. But I think in the meantime, I think what we'll continue to see in, in real term across the world is instead maybe a shift towards more uh, decision making, more emphasis on, uh, you know, let's say more ad hoc uh, coalitions and alliances. You know, we have you know, so many at times mapping ones, you know, obviously there's been a lot of focus uh, over the past couple of years on the quad you know, especially as it relates to the Asia Pacific. Now, obviously, we saw the the, the whole controversy around the AUKUS deal. Uh, and I think that kind of uh, setup, you know, and we, we've got the G7, of course, that the G20 uh, summit is coming up. Those kinds of formats might be where we might see a lot of sort of international attention, sort of multilateral attention be focused. While, you know, obviously, there'll be a amount of focus and attention uh, and, then, and the, the, the space that the UN occupies, which we you know, talked about a lot today. Uh, but in terms of uh, the, the blockages on reform, that might force others to, to look elsewhere in finding these more ad hoc uh, you know, alliances and partnerships where they can you know, advance their interests with uh, uh, you know, others that are more like-minded to, you know, to, to their, you know, each government's views. Yeah, I think this, I mean, this remains a persistent concern uh, for diplomats around the UN that we are seeing uh, decision-making increasingly shift away from uh, the Security Council and from from UN bodies more generally and shifting towards, on the one hand, uh, coalitions like the G7, but also uh, regional institutions such as, as, as the African Union. And again, if you look at our, our annual publication um, on challenges for the UN, uh, one issue that we talk about there is the need to strengthen cooperation between the UN and, and the African Union um, to ensure that those two organizations, both of which Crisis Group works with very closely, are addressing problems like uh, the political crisis in Sudan in a, in a joined up fashion um, rather than uh, being at odds. We're getting close to the end of our time. Um, uh, I have one question has come in from the audience, uh, and that's about um, Palestine. And you know, it's worth saying that when we draw up our publication about 10 challenges for the UN every year, we're always very conscious that we have to leave out a lot of major problems um, on the, the UN agenda. And so this year, uh, you know, we weren't able for just for reasons of space to address um, situations like Myanmar, uh, like Ethiopia, or like the breaking crisis in Nagorno-Karabakh, um, which certainly do deserve more attention from the UN. But you know, the one tragically, absolutely persistent view that we, um, you know, we could include in every single annual publication is the uh, Palestinian situation. Um, again, something which the Security Council debates uh, every month, um, but where the UN makes very little progress. Um, Ashish, how would you assess you know, recent debates about um, uh, Israeli-Palestinian relations uh, in, in the UN? Um, have we sort of seen any any really notable developments this this year on that front? Hey, Richard. Uh, on that one, it's uh, there's been some let's say strange parallels to last year, where I think it was May last year, where the uh, you know uh, really serious escalation uh, you know, happened on the ground, and the Security Council you know reacted in you know I guess in in some ways as best it could. Um, you know, this is an issue where uh, there is a major blockage in terms of what the council is and isn't able to do. And that blockage is, as, as we know, is, is the U.S., which you know, certainly doesn't want the council to take any major decisions that could um, 
alienate its uh, its uh, you know, strong ally in Israel, uh, and we we saw similar dynamics play out last month, uh, you know, in, in early August with the latest round of escalations, where the council was able to meet and convene, uh, you know, to discuss the the recent runs, runs of these. But thankfully, uh, in a sense, you know, in, in relation to last year, because uh, the the uh, tensions were uh, at least for the moment, um, you know, uh, brought to a halt uh, fairly quickly. The council it almost saved the council from its own worst tendencies, where there was almost no space uh, and time to discuss, uh, you know, concrete things like a, uh, uh, you know, uh, delivering a press statement, uh, you know, that would force the council members to, you know, come together and then agree on a common message, which obviously would have been quite tricky. Uh, so, so in, in a way, I think um, uh, that uh, that uh, you know, saved the council some blushes. It certainly, I imagine, saved American diplomats in New York some blushes as well. Um, but it's also been a, a file where there's been a good amount of of cross-regional coordination, which again may not be that um, important to our listeners who are away from New York and the UN bubble, but just to see the likes of uh, Norway, who have a, a, obviously uh, uh, an interest in this, and partially uh, because the uh, UN Special Coordinator uh, himself is uh, Norwegian, but then also uh, you know working together with the Arab member of the Council in the UAE, uh, and also with the uh, with the Chinese, who have just by complete coincidence uh, been the member that was chairing the Security Council both this August and then last May, uh, to continue to at the very least show that the Council can come together at least to discuss the crisis, which in itself you know. Given the, the sort of times that we're in geopolitically, uh, you know, was something that council members appreciated that the way that these members were able to to get the council together. Uh, now, in terms of this big issue of. Uh, you know uh, that that's coming up, uh, potentially coming up uh, at the UN regarding Palestine trying to get full membership. Uh, I think um, that that seems to be an issue that actually has to go through the Security Council. And so, if that is raised uh, in in some shape or form uh, at the at the Council, you know that would be one that I would imagine would end with a U.S. veto, which the you know, U.S. officials may not want to uh, uh, you know take that step. So I think there are some questions over whether that kind of uh, move by the Palestinians could also be a pretext or. Try to extract some concessions on other issues and what those issues are are yet unclear. But you know we could see some diplomacy around this because I think uh, Mahmoud Abbas uh, next week you know I think is uh, or was expected to uh, make a call for this from the GA lectern. Uh, but the actual decision itself, uh, as far as I understand, given uh, the, the way that the UN works regarding full membership, actually has to uh, firstly come through the Security Council. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Um, you cannot become a member of the UN without having the approval of, of the Security Council. Um, so I was about to wrap up, but my uh, my last comment inspired one more question uh, from the audience when I referred to Ethiopia. Um, and we, we have a question, which is, will we see any discussion of uh, Ethiopia um, and the renewed uh, war there uh, during the General Assembly? Um, Crisis Group has... Uh, you know, has called. Um, in fact, in, in a statement we put out, uh, I think last week, um, for African leaders to use the General Assembly session as an opportunity uh, to convene diplomatic discussions about the renewal of war in, in Ethiopia. Um, but I, I'm afraid to say that what we're hearing so far from our diplomatic contacts is that there is not much appetite either in the African group or in the UN membership more generally, um, to make the situation in Ethiopia a, a priority for the General Assembly. Um, the Ethiopian government itself uh, appears to have been lobbying uh, other African countries, including the African members of the Security Council, uh, which are currently Kenya, Ghana and Gabon, uh, not to um, have any big public discussions um, of uh, the renewed the renewed conflict um, in and around Tigray. Um, Ashish, is, is, is that your understanding too, that we're, we're unlikely, sadly, to see much action on, on Ethiopia at the General Assembly? Unfortunately so, Richard, that, that appears the case. And I, you know, I imagine, uh, you know, in terms of the wider discussions on uh, food security and uh, you know, food security, particularly in the Horn of Africa, you know, those might be opportunities where uh, you know, officials will get to raise concern about the renewed fighting uh, and especially the humanitarian consequences of, of that fighting. Uh, you know, especially uh, in a, in a time where there is the, the the famine across much of the region. Uh, 
Um, but I think beyond that, unfortunately, you know, on the political side of things, uh, not really expecting too much. And I think that also reflects, uh, in a way, this uh, this sort of difficult uh, uh, situation where you, know, you have a regional uh, organization and uh, uh, you know in, in in charge of a mediation process in the African Union. Uh, you also have a quite a uh, interested regional uh, neighboring member state in Kenya, which has played a central role in trying to facilitate some amount of dialogue to try to really uh, unpack and address the major political questions at play. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, in in uh, in in a case where there hasn't been much to show for those efforts in terms of concrete terms, in terms of you know, anything that resembles a, a meaningful, sustainable uh, peace agreement. Uh, the UN and members of the Security Council have had very little uh, space to jump in to try to play a role, to try to push for uh, some amount of uh, uh, you know, decision making here at, in New York that could help move things along. And, you know, I think this is one where as much as, you know, in, in a just to bring back to something that we started with as we as we end this conversation, you know, we, we've talked about how there's been a lot of disquiet among African member states uh, in the wake of the Ukraine war um, uh, about the overfocus on European issues, on Ukraine-Russia issues, and a neglect of African issues and issues around the globe. But, you know, I think a valid uh, uh, response from uh, some Western uh, officials and ambassadors at the UN has been that, you know, look at Ethiopia. This is an issue where you haven't allowed any of us at the UN, at the Security Council, to really uh, play much of a role at all. So, uh, you know, how do you sort of you know, square those two things, right? And so I think that, that that does reflect, again, that sometimes even if on a broader scale, you know, member states will feel uh, you know, quite justified in wanting more attention to their regions, to their continents, when it comes down to it, if it's a, uh, you know, a country or a specific conflict uh, that's closer to home, one where they would like to keep this issue from being quote unquote nationalized, you know, where once it comes to the UN, where it comes to the Security Council, they feel like they lose control over the management of that crisis. You know, it, it can again, you know, uh, uh, create this sort of a, a situation where the tendency to uh, be more cautious wins out again. You know, sadly. Well, that is that is a um, a sad note to end on, but uh, I think a, a realistic one. Um, and we do have to end. Um, I have to go to a meeting about Security Council reform, but I, I wouldn't get too excited. I don't think we're going to. Um, <laughs> get any Security Council reform this week. Um, thanks so much, Ashish. Uh, that's been a great conversation. And thanks to everyone who has been listening in and um, to those who've posed questions. Uh, sorry if, if we've missed any, uh, any questions along the way. Um, so I, I'm sure that if you're listening to this, you're likely to be following the General Assembly next week. Um, you should be following Crisis Group's uh, Twitter account. Um, uh, please also follow Ashish and me on on, on Twitter, we will be uh, uh, doing live uh, Twitter commentary on some of the, um, the main speeches, such as President Biden's uh, uh, speech and uh, President Zelensky's speech, um, if Zelensky does get the go-ahead to, uh, uh, to give a special address. Um, you can uh, find our annual publication on the General Assembly, which I've referred to a couple of times on Crisis Group's uh, front page. Um, if you enjoy uh, podcasts, uh, we will be releasing a podcast tomorrow, um, the Hold Your Fire podcast hosted by Crisis Group's Vice President, uh, Richard Atwood. Um, he and I will be talking about um, uh, the General Assembly, um, although if you've listened to me today, it's a bit repetitive, um, but still that should be a, a good listen. Um, yeah, Crisis Group will be all over the General Assembly and uh, we... We can't wait until next Thursday or Friday when things will start to be calming down in New York after what will be uh, almost certainly a pretty exhausting week. Um, for those of you working in or on the UN, good luck with the General Assembly week. Um, and uh, for everyone else, uh, have a great weekend. Thank you very much indeed. Bye for now. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, everyone.